So Pat, you just want me to take over then? <laughs> I'm waiting okay. for the record. There we go. Oh, okay. All right. So welcome everyone. My name is Patrick Manning, teaching this seminary school of theology, and uh, we're happy to welcome everyone for this final event of our uh, second annual contemplative community week. Uh, so we have this uh, this panel on contemplative pedagogy and uh, why this is why this is worthwhile. Uh, so we're going to have Kelly Geddert from the Department of Psychology, uh, Lisa Rose Wiles from the library, uh, and hopefully Grace May in Education Studies. I uh, also want to acknowledge that we have uh, a number of our other uh, CP fellows here, our Contemplative Pedagogy Fellows. So these are people who have completed some, some training, done a couple of seminars to learn about uh, Contemplative Pedagogy uh, and to be uh, resources for our colleagues. And we, we have people here representing just about every, every school and many different disciplines here, here at the university. Uh, so I've uh, I've asked our, our panelists uh, to talk about why they were attracted to CP, uh, what their experience with it has been so far, and and maybe uh, what some of uh, the benefits have been as they've seen it. So uh, Kelly, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me see if I can manage the sharing piece of this. And so I did. Um, I wasn't sure whether to do slides or not. And then I looked back at what um, Pat asked us to do and I saw the seven to eight minutes. And so I thought I, I need slides for seven to eight minutes. Uh, and I thought it might be um, helpful uh, just in, in terms of having some visuals to think about things. Um, so um, as Pat said, he had asked us to talk a little bit about what brought us um, to contemplative pedagogy and um, what we've done with it and then what we see the benefits of it. And you know, just a little bit about um, my own journey uh, through this. Uh, for me, uh, this has been a, um, just a really fantastic experience bringing contemplative pedagogy into the classroom. And so right now you're seeing my screen and it's just this like split, right? <laughs> kind of like a fracture. And essentially what I had in my life before I started doing this and actually, you know, the group here, a lot of contemplative fellows here um, was essentially a fracture. And I think a lot of us do. And so on one side of my life, I had kind of a, a deep kind of spiritual a uh, dimension that involved a lot of contemplation. Uh, in one side of my life, I'm a meditation teacher and student uh, at a Buddha center in New York City. And so that was one side of my life. And then I had this other side of my life uh, where I was at Seton Hall campus and teaching students and you know doing service and all the other research, all the other things we do as faculty. Uh, and it did feel like uh, quite a fracture to me. Uh, I, as a person who's not Catholic, I wasn't sure how to bring in the spiritual side of uh, especially a religion that was so different than the Catholicism. And so I just kept it separate. Uh, but then a few things started to happen. So um, a friend of mine actually in uh, the Buddhist Center introduced me to a book I ended up using in my human, neuroscience, human neuropsychology course called How Emotions Are Made. Uh, so I'm a cognitive psychologist by training, and I also do work in um, neuropsychology and neuroscience. And um, the leading edge of neuroscience is really pointing us to a vision of the brain that is much more holistic than the way that cognitive psychologists have divided it up traditionally. Uh, and in this book, there's actually a chapter, uh, the 13th chapter of this book, uh, is actually about Buddhism. And this is written by one of the leading uh, cognitive neuroscientists working in uh, the neuroscience of emotion. Uh, so I started using that in my classroom and I started to see like how uh, ideas of contemplation and how taking control of your own mind and learning how to train your own mind and work with your own mind uh, could be brought into the classroom. And then we had a speaker in uh, our psychology department for our lunch talk series. And was, the speaker was a Benedictine. And he said something I'll never forget. And he said, you know, the, the first um, rule of Benedict, and I'm kind of looking closely at my screen here because uh, is 
to listen with the ear of your heart. Uh, and this is something that I've kind of internalized ever since then before I sit down in meetings with uh, particularly students, but also colleagues. Um, I remind myself to listen with the ear of the heart. Uh, and that has changed my interactions with others just incredibly. So these two things like started to happen for me. I started to see like little ways to bring uh, contemplation uh, into my interactions with students. Uh, and then um, this crashing thing happened to all of us, which is COVID hit. Uh, and the level of anxiety and uh, really uh, trauma and just sense of being afraid that I saw in my students uh, was just like unfathomable to me. And so when we were um, online and hybrid, uh, I started uh, working uh, contemplation into my classroom more explicitly. And so at that time, I started actually uh, doing five minute meditations uh, with my students. I'd have two students sitting in the classroom with me, uh, you know, 23, 24 people at home. Uh, and I started with five minute guided meditations. And, um, <clears throat> And it, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what I did and how I do kind of introduce these activities differently in my different classes. Um, but in those classes, they were really kind of centering meditations, getting people to settle their minds a little bit, and um, also getting people to sort of develop some intentions for the coming hour or so that we had together uh, is the way that I framed those. Uh, and so I, um, now, in terms of the way that I use contemplation, uh, is, is slightly different. Uh, so for one, I teach cognitive psychology. And cognitive psychology, one of the things that we talk about, or like, the goal of cognitive psychology is how the mind works, like figuring out how the mind works. And uh, you know, a as a cognitive psychologist, I come at this from an external science perspective. Uh, but when we think about contemplation, contemplation is really kind of an internal science, right? Where we go inward uh, and we think about how our own mind works. And there's lots of research in cognitive psychology and neuroscience just showing, showing how beneficial um, being able to introspect, do some meditation, quiet the mind is for our attention, for our ability to learn, and so forth. Um, so that's the way I kind of introduce contemplative activities in my cognitive psychology classroom. Um, I'm also this semester teaching a course uh, called Orientation of the Psychology Major for the first time. And in this class, I have uh, mostly freshmen, uh, a few sophomores or juniors, but these are uh, individuals who've just declared the psychology major. Uh, and in many ways, uh, the goal of this class is uh, is contemplation in a way. Uh, most of the assignments are reflection assignments. Uh, we use this book called The Psychology Major's Handbook. I don't know, it's hard to even I have these little virtual things to show things. And, um, and so really uh, this is teaching the students essentially how to be good college students and how to be successful adults in many ways, uh, and then how to do that within the context of a psychology curriculum and psychology career. Um, but one of the chapters in this uh, psychology majors handbook is on self-management. And so for this class, I've introduced um, some my contemplation techniques as uh, a, as a way of self-management. Uh, and so in particular, I just wanted to share uh, the things I've shared with this class. Uh, so in this class, um, we do in the first three minutes of every class, we do three, min three minutes of silent centering. And so I've, I've stopped the guided meditation, I've just moved to um, just a, a silent centering for the first three minutes of class. Uh, and so for the students, I really am tying this in this class to these self-management skills. Um, because I think especially, uh, you know, our students are coming in as freshmen and when I read about Gen Z and what their life is like and, and I'm looking at what my life is like, 
right? We are so driven by the externals all the time. Like there's stuff just grabbing for our attention. And as all of us were just chatting before this session started, like so many of us were so busy this week, we didn't get to do some of the contemplative week things we wanted to do. Um, I found myself double booked, um, you know, triple booked for a few times this week. So, um, you know, we spend all of our life so driven by these externals. And so I really ask my students to contemplate, like, where is the you in your life? Like, where is kind of the stable center? And what is driving kind of what you do from, uh, from moment to moment? And, uh, and a way to think about this, and I realized now I wanted to kind of put myself in here, but I, and I'm hiding the slides, I think. So it's just like, is your mind a balloon or an anvil, right? And so when we're driven by the externals, right? When things go well, we're like, woohoo, and we, we blow one way. Uh, and then, you know, when things go poorly and then we're just, be, you know, in, or they don't go our way, then um, we become despondent. So we're constantly being tossed about like a balloon. But wouldn't it be great if we could be more like an anvil and that is stable and strong and have the center and be the direction for our own life, like no matter what happens. Um, so these are the different ways in which I kind of introduce a uh, contemplative uh, activity uh, to my students in the classroom. And um, as I mentioned, I, I, when we were in the pandemic mode, I started out with this is five minute meditations. Uh, I would have on exam days, um, I didn't want to take away from exam time. I would tell students if they wanted to come five minutes early, I would lead a meditation before class and about two thirds of the class would come five minutes early uh, to get the meditation. Uh, this is when we were in high flex mode. It's a little harder to do when we're shuffling in and out of classes and there's a whole group of 25 students waiting in the hall to come in and so forth. So I haven't been able to do it in person as well. Um, I moved to three minute silent centering uh, this year. Uh, and in some ways it's an experiment, like it, just not wanting to impose too much on my students. Uh, but um, trying to establish kind of some of the same basic principles and give them a little bit more flexibility to um, do with that con contemplative time what they wanted rather than necessarily uh, guiding them in something. Uh, my student feedback um, on this has been um, mostly positive. Uh, I did some mid-semester questions about this when I first started using the five-minute meditations. And, and I was actually going to, you know, make a class change if, if there was a lot of negative feedback about it, but most people said they liked it. Um, only one person said that they would prefer, prefer it not to happen uh, across several sections. Um, I had some students write on the end of the semester evaluations, they looked forward to coming to my class because of the three minute silent centering. Uh, but I don't know that students would necessarily call out that they don't like it. So, I, um, so I'm not sure how, how good that is. Uh, and so this is what I've done. Um, Pat asked to talk about benefits. Uh, and, and actually I think I've got like really big picture Pat instead of just a small picture. So, um, so uh, one of the things I think that we're doing is it, by thinking about our teaching this way and everything we do this way is really thinking about developing the person. And this is something like when I think about my cognitive psychology class, like no one learns well when they're anxious and overwhelmed and just, you know, like their brain is so cluttered. So there's something incredibly practical about getting students into like a really safe, peaceful space, you know, as, and, uh, you know, as, as we can, as much as, as much as we can. Uh, and I think in, in a way, like just as I was feeling fractured before I let all of this kind of into uh, my work life and before I started, um, so starting last year, becoming a contemplative pedagogy fellow, just amazing, amazing group of people. Um, but I was feeling really fractured. And I think, uh, I think there's a tendency in higher ed for us to treat our students in a fractured way as well. And I think um, it's probably good for every human being, but probably particularly for Gen Z, 
they I think they want to be taught as a as a whole person. So we're developing a whole person, which so I think is very practical. It makes people more productive. Uh, I think it makes people happier <laughs> and happier people are actually good for the society. So um, we're like, you know, it, it, happy, peaceful people um, don't don't start wars. So that's <laughs> so those are like big picture benefits. Um, and then I wasn't sure who would be here, but I did want to point out um, some suggested readings. So the Heart of Higher Education, the, the Contemplative Pedagogy Fellows have been reading together. And this is a layperson's book, How Emotions Are Made. It's a great book. Um, we all have a mind if you want to learn more about how it works, how your mind works, how to drive your car. Uh, I would welcome that so or encourage that. Yeah, but hopefully I didn't talk too much. <laughs> great. No, all fascinating. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, all right, on to you, Lisa. I'm just going to close my door because people are talking in the hallway. The perils of doing Teams things from your office on a Friday afternoon when things are busy. Yes, I can. You leave your door open and we'll count them in our numbers for attendance. <laughs> there you go. I should drag them in here, shouldn't I? So Kelly, in some ways we have almost opposite but complementary stories of our entry into this, I think. Apart from the fact that I had done yoga for many years and so I was accustomed to yoga relaxation, I had never been involved in meditation or any other contemplative activities and still until I started being embedded in Peter Sabastano's classes. And as most of you probably know, Peter is one of those I think maybe the first to use meditation in classes here at Seton Hall, and he's done it for many, many years, and he's meditated for many, many years. And that was my introduction, which although I enjoyed the meditations personally, my attraction to it originally was, was intellectual. Um, and part of it was also in his class. He talked about the benefits of meditation and so on. So I was interested in it from a physiological and neurological and sort of stress relief point of view long before I was really interested in it in a pedagogical kind of way, if that makes sense. And really this, I guess, reached its culmination, A, when I was somehow invited, and Pat, I still don't know how I got invited to that wonderful retreat up in Mendham, but somehow, I was invited to the the founding of the Contemplative Pedagogy Fellows, or well, there was a committee then to start with, and I just never left. You know, I, I infiltrated the group and they never kicked me out, so I never left. And then I became interested in the pedagogy aspect, but I also became interested in the personal practice for myself on the grounds, as many people have said, that you can't really teach about something if you're not doing it. And I can't say that I have been religiously observant about meditating every day like I should, but I have tried to make it a regular practice. So one of the breakthroughs for me was I had been in this, this wonderful meditation group and our contemplative pedagogy group, and I had never felt able or qualified to, to lead a meditation myself. You know, I always said, these people know what they've been doing. They've been doing it for years. They do a much better job than I would. So I would just kind of attend and not offer to lead. And then one day Peter said, he emailed me and said, oh, I can't make it to class today. Something's wrong with him. And can I lead the class? Which was fine. I typically take one or two of his classes when he's at conferences and things. That didn't scare me at all. I taught anthropology for years. What was scary was he said, and can you lead the, the opening meditation? And this was when in anthropology of consciousness, where it's like a 15 minute opening meditation. And I was like, oh no. But I thought, all right, well, I'll give it a try. And I didn't have much time to prepare because it had just been that morning, you know, that he had felt ill and had asked me to do it. And it was an 11 o'clock class. So I went in and it was it was very extemporaneous, apart from the usual, you know, posture and breathing and so on, which I was very familiar with. And at the end of it, I sort of came out of it and I was like, oh, wow, I did that. Well, that wasn't so bad, was it? I don't know what the students thought. 
And the funny thing was, I can't even remember what I said. And I have since talked to Antony Nicotera about the sense of you're leading a meditation and you lose track of time and you're you're conscious of saying things, but you're not really conscious of what you're saying. It's like the words just come. He He referred to that as grace, and I would tend to agree with him. But at the time, I think it was just plain stage fright. But after that, I got motivated to start doing little meditations of my own at the beginning of class. And as most of you know, as, as a librarian, we don't get to teach our own classes. We get to be visitors in other people's classes. And so I would tentatively start asking a few people of whom I think Kelly was one that, um, you know, do you mind if I start with like five minute meditation? I was a little hesitant about it, but I tend to teach a lot for the same people all the time and they were really supportive and into it. So this was going well. And then, as Kelly said, you had the, the, the picture of the big nasty virus with all its spikes. That happened. And in our case, and I would imagine for most of you too, it was like this almost instant pivot from teaching in person to completely teaching online. And we were also doing all of our research appointments switch from being in person to to online and working at home, which was a bit of a mixed blessing. And I will do one little PowerPoint picture in a moment. And like Kelly, I really noticed that our students were very, very stressed. So I started introducing these little meditations, very, very brief, like, you know, sitting and body scan and breathing, and then maybe just a couple of minutes of stress release based. I did a few very modified loving kindness meditations. I was experimenting myself. Um, I did try to do a few of sort of silent meditations, but the feedback I was getting was they didn't like the silent meditation. They got too easily distracted. Um, bearing in mind, we're completely virtual at this time. The other thing that coincided and really brought this together for me, not just in the classroom, but personally, very early on, at the end of March, my husband got COVID very, very badly, extremely badly. In fact, if it hadn't been the fact that the emergency wards were where people were dying at the time, he probably would have been in there because he was running a fever of 104 plus for well over a week. And it, it took him months to get over it. And he needed round the clock attention. So thank God I could work at home. But as you can imagine, with a heavy teaching schedule and all our sort of library work being done from home and being up most of the night with my husband, making sure that he was breathing and constantly feeding him aspirins and cold cloths. I was a little bit stressed. And it was at that point that I think I really started to reap the benefits of being able to take some time to meditate, to get me, help me get through that. And also, Thank God we have a house with a garden because we were in lockdown then and I had somewhere where I could go out and spend some time, you know, in the grace of a garden. Well, they say you are never closer to God than in a garden. And also my meditation group, which we had said early on, we had been meeting, I had not gone all the time to um, the little chapel in Xavier. No, not the one over there. And they were a lifeline for me. I mean, our little group, we've been together so long, we've had a few people come in and out, but we've been so supportive of one another. And I just felt so surrounded by love and prayer and support with that group. And eventually my husband started to improve and didn't need as much attention. And But it was still really good that I was home with him because he relapsed quite a few times. So that was sort of my story of how the intellectual component and the pedagogy component and the personal component, actually rather than fracturing, they reinforced one another. Oh, and the other interesting thing that I forgot to mention was in the midst of all this, I was writing the uh, literature review for a paper on contemplative pedagogy with particular reference to libraries. So again, that was very much the intellectual side. So I'm reading all these papers and summarizing and my, my group actually helped me with some directions for that too. So I was living it and I was teaching it and I was writing about it. And we were also still virtual through the hybrid phase that, that Kelly mentioned. But um, since we've been back in person last semester, I've been doing a very informal, before I do the meditations at the beginning of classes, I just do a little poll, just put your hands up if you meditate. And usually I get yes and like 
half. So the counting is is very subjective. But in general, out of the like nearly 30 classes that I've taught, about 20 percent of students do meditate, not necessarily regularly, but they have some kind of meditation. And um, I know we've talked about this a little bit before, and I think Kelly, both you and Angela have said that you've introduced some meditation in, in first year classes. And the final thing that I'm going to end up with is that for the first time in many years since Marion retired, I actually get to co-teach in a class that's partly of my own designing. It's part of our Mission Mentors um, project with Anthony Hayner and Yusuf Yakubi, and I get to do meditations at the beginning of each one. And because I'm teaching every class or co-teaching every class, I do get to do a progression of different things that, that match our themes. And they, they seem to like it. I get very good feedback. I think one of the main benefits is that it does settle them down. It does help a little bit, they say, with stress. And they're more focused on the class. And I think that this is a little speculative. I'd love to see what other people think. I think it makes people kinder to one another. This, this sense of we're meditating together, especially when we do, I, I do quite a few on the theme of connectedness, you know, connectedness with the earth and our bodies and our fellow humans and this, the environment. I think it does make people kind and more compassionate to do some meditation. And the last one we had last week, uh, Sister Ange Marie came. Remember, that was one of our things that was on our program and did a, a a beautiful contemplation for us, which was very nice. And I was delighted to meet her. We planned to keep in touch. Um, this is the first time that I've actually met a cloistered nun other than to say hello, sister, in passing and sat down. We went out for coffee first and had about 45 minutes conversation in planning for the class and she attended our class. So um, I think that's probably about all I have to say. Oh, except I will share just because you know, Kelly was so organized. This is this is my share for my for the classes that I do. So some of you will remember seeing this fellow at meetings. He is the great meditator, Mr. Patches. He is an excellent meditator. And this this is the image that I use for for our meditations. Um, if they don't want to close their eyes, you know, I put that up and I say, if you're not comfortable closing your eyes, you can just soften your gaze and look somewhere. I'm very conscious of what Merrill had um, reinforced for us, the need to make sure that students don't think we're telling them to make their art to close their eyes. So I think that's all I have to say. And wonderfully enough, Grace has miraculously appeared. Just in the nick of time. Uh, Grace, are you still up for it? Uh, I'm still over in Bethany and I'm sitting on a little stoop here. Uh, <laughs> we just finished our meeting. Um, so I, I'm, I feel like I'm without context. Um, so I, I'm not sure if you want me to say anything or I'm happy to just sit and listen. So, to I mean, yeah, so we've just, uh, we, we heard from Kelly and then Lisa, they both shared a bit about how they, um, you know, why they were attracted to contemplative pedagogy initiative, sort of, you know, what their experience has been with that and maybe what some of the benefits have been. Um, so no, I know you're really jumping from a, in from a very different thing. So if uh, you know if you have something you'd like to offer, then please. But otherwise, we can we can start taking questions. Um, so can I share one thing? Please. Um, so um, I joined this group because I felt that um, there was something missing in my teaching that um, didn't have I didn't have words for it. And now I feel like I have the words um, and more of a focus. How this contemplative practice has given me a sense of um, a framework. And so I'll give a very specific example. So for those who are in the group, they know that I um, love that quote that we had from Marie last year about the holy pause. And you know, what does it mean to use a pause to interrupt between the gut response and then our, our um, reaction. And so this week with both my juniors and my seniors, we did our contemplative little meditation at the beginning of class. And then I put that quote up on the board and I asked them within the context of the topics we were covering, 
why did they think that I, I put that up there? And why did I think this concept of a pause was so important? And we might have talked about something like that in the past, but I never would have had a, a, a way to frame it. And what came out of that was great. And so now I have this shorthand lingo with my students, particularly when they're struggling with challenges with their kids in schools. And I can ask them, what about the pause? Did you think about taking a pause, not only for yourself, but offering it to them? And I think it's just transformed um, the layers of conversation that we have. And, and I'm forever grateful. So thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Grace. And thanks for, for jumping in, going from one thing to another. Um, all right. So. Uh, we can take a little bit of time and 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 open it up for some questions and, and conversation. So maybe we'll we'll give uh, first dibs to uh, to our guests if they if they have uh, anything. But if not, then uh, can open it up to any of our CP fellows if you want to just engage any of our panelists around what the, what they've said. So any questions for anyone or any comments? Yeah, please, Marianne. So thank you, everyone. Um, it's so nice to get to hear a little. I was deeply tempted by this offer last spring, put upon contemplation. I could not pile it in, but now I feel sad that I didn't ditch something else. Um, I would like to hear from you all. You know, I, I try to read. I think this work is adjacent to a lot of kind of learner centered conversations. And there was a great article in the Chronicle about sometimes the pushback you hear involves the rigor word and about how doing all this stuff is not. I don't feel that way. But when I think about this and I think about trying to get our colleagues on board um, to do this, I just want to know if maybe some of you are rigor converts, because I think I maybe am a little bit of a rigor convert, um, but that wasn't really doing what I used to do. So that's it's a pretty it's not a very uh, well formed question, but I just when you hear rigor, what do you think? What are you doing now and how can we get other people to create these classrooms where students you know, just as a side comment, a barrier to student success is not feeling like they belong in the community of the classroom. And I think that I forget who now said that this helps create community with kindness and community. So that was my thought that this is really building up that aspect and rigor, I think, can kind of create competition and stuff. Thanks, Marianne. Um, so oh, again, I'll give uh, first ta first take at that to our our panelists, but if None of you want to say something. I think we have lots of other people here who you could fall back on. So did any of our panelists want to speak to this? Yeah, Lisa. Well, I can say something very brief to this. And of course, you know, bearing in mind, I don't teach regular classes, but I used to, and particularly in biology. And so it's funny you should raise this, Mary, because I had the experience just yesterday of I had just taught a couple of English classes and I had done a meditation at the beginning and a couple of young ladies asked if they could stay in the space to study for it just so happened a gen bio exam on the vertebrates which I used to teach this stuff so they're not really supposed to be there they're supposed to go to a group study room but I said well just be quiet and don't draw you know, it's after hours by now um, don't draw attention to yourself and if somebody comes and tells you to leave you're going to have to go but so I'm looking at as they're, they're writing and I walk back and forth and I pointed I said no that's not how you spell cartilage and no chondrichthines goes up there and you know giving them a few pointers and they were getting kind of stressed about it so I'm getting ready to leave I'm walking through to wash my coffee mug and they are still at it so I, I just said to them remember the meditation that we did at the beginning of class do you think maybe you'd like to do another five minutes? Because they were they looked like they were in there for the long haul. And we did, and they they thanked me very much. But I think I get the rigor question too, Marianne, and especially in the sciences, because so much of it is not, you know, they tend to think of this as warm, fuzzy stuff. It's you have to memorize all of the cranial nerves and you have to know all the characteristics of the vertebrates. This was just driven back to me last night. You've just got to know that stuff. And whether or not we agree with that, I mean, that's sort of the mentality through at least the early stages of the sciences. And my little pushback on that is you are not going to remember this stuff a day after the exam if all you do is cram it into your head with no context. And so you can know all you like and regurgitate it. But if you don't understand it, if it's not in a context, what good is it really other than being able to pass the exam 
so like for example when they they were putting all their the features of, of vertebrates and different stages of vertebrates and so on. I was trying to get them to, well, visualize a shark. This is what a shark looks like. Go look at a picture of a shark. You know, what does it mean that they have a dual chambered heart? Go look at it, you know, this, this kind of thing. And I think if we could encourage folks to do a, a little more thinking that way, we could reconcile the rigor with this idea of being more reflective. So. Sorry, that was long. That's my thoughts about that. But it just came so happily on the heels of these two students. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, John, you want to jump in on it? Yeah, I wanted to take a swing at the rigor question. Um, like, I get the criticism that, you know, if you cut out time from class for meditation, you must be less rigorous because you're covering less material. And I guess I would try to take rigor to a different level of uh, a life, right? So like developing a meditative practice is rigorous. And if it's something that you can bring yourself and discipline yourself to do, then that self-discipline and self-rigor is something that's going to carry you through so many other things besides just a class. It's going to give uh, focus and order to a life. And then hopefully it's not just about order, it's also about getting in tune with a higher power and a community. And those are, uh, you know, you can't grade that stuff, but we're really not talking about that much class time. <laughs> or like for my classes, maybe a minute or two, and I know I'm doing it wrong, I should double that and go to, toward five minutes. Um, so as the, rigorous educator planning a class session, I'm making that decision. And anybody who thinks it's not rigorous, I feel a little bit bad for them and would maybe invite them to the class to give it a try and, and, and see if it might work for them. Um, but so that, that's a little bit of my understanding of practice is it, it, it's something that is uh, part of a, a disciplined life. Thanks so much, John. Uh, Chad, jump in here. Uh, uh, the great question, Marianne. Great question. I um, when I hear this, I actually think of my family doctor. I think you, you, rigor rigor has a different has different um, uh, valences for me. I, I think that a, a family doctor could be very focused on the details of your illness and figure that out very quickly and move on to the next patient. But we're learning, I think one of the things we're trying to learn in this group is being patient and being present. And my, one of the reasons my family doctor is great is because he sits there and he knows me. He asks questions about me. We have ongoing conversations about art or theology or politics or, or the state of healthcare in America. And it's, a holistic view and it's I'm I don't just feel like a number I, f I go there and I kind of almost look forward to it just to see how he's doing so um I think we can we can pursue rigor at the expense of humanity and presence in being a person and amongst other people um, in this world so anyway great question I like it a lot thanks so much thank you Chad yeah real generative question everyone's jumping in here Kelly um, yeah, I think this is a great question. And Marianne, I think you probably know too. I might be a former rigor person, I, and, and but I would go with what, what John said is that it's not unrigorous, but I, uh, if you had told me 12 years ago that I would be taking time out of my class to devote to meditation, I would have laughed. I would just have laughed. And um, because I would have thought there's so much we need to cover and there's only these minutes and we have to get it all in. And I think I'm actually, I know a number of people who are here today were at this talk. I'm just gonna grab the book uh, that I ended up getting because I um, can't remember the person's name. Keith Sawyer was, gave a talk on the creative classroom uh, about three weeks ago. I think the Center for Faculty Development had a special talk. And um, he used this phrase instructionism and that really as a society, we have this view of education as instructionism, which is kind of like a filling a bucket version of education. And that education is about 
just like this, the teacher conveying information and the student just kind of soaking it up. And I think all of us know that that actually doesn't work very well. Uh, and I do have some, you know, sympathy. I, you know, I'm, I'm in the social sciences. There are things that need to be covered. But at the same time, that information is just going to be shed a day later if the students aren't doing the right things and developing skills with that information. Uh, so, you know, in what the way that I've thought about this is like rethinking what the students should be doing in the classroom versus on their own, like memorizing terms doesn't need to happen together in the classroom. Uh, there is more things that they can do on their own. Um, I do think it requires, and this is not something I've been good at and I need to get better at, is educating the students at the beginning of the semester about what the classroom is going to be like and what your expectations are and why. Uh, and this Keith Sawyer, I'm just gonna steal all his stuff today. Uh, he introduced the talk the other week by saying, you know, how many of you had, you know, had a class that you got an A in that you don't remember anything from? Um, and I forget the other question he had, but, but it was kind of like just pointing out like how ridiculous it is we get A's, you know, especially those of us who are professors, get A's and things and don't remember a thing from that class. And it's like, that, that's education? Uh, I mean, that's kind of the way I feel about it. So for me, I think a lot of it is like changing your expectations around what needs to happen in the classroom versus what you put responsibility on the students for what they can handle themselves, but then also really teaching and, and being very conscious ahead of time about how to frame it for the students. Thanks so much, Kelly. Uh, yeah, if I can take my moderator prerogative, you know, it, it, Kelly, for me, what you're saying raises a point. We, a number of years, a couple of years back, we had Daniel Barbazat, who is, uh, you know, CP royalty. And uh, I, I remember one of the things that he had us do is just think about very big picture. What are our picture, what are our goals for our classes. And I, Marianne, I bring this back to your question because, you know, we, we've talked a lot, as we often do, about CP as in, incorporating meditation in class, but there are many other ways to do this. You know, there's reflective writing, there is, uh, you know, deeply reading things slowly. But I would say even the, the pedagogical act of reflecting uh, carefully uh, and thoughtfully about the goals for the course it is an act of, of contemplative teaching and to and to Kelly's point to really and John's too to really think about what what's really important for my students to get out of this class and it might be more than a particular competency or knowledge set it might be something about their their growth as human beings or professional so I, I think I think it's important to recognize that this is part of what it means to teach in a contemplative way as well. Um, so yeah, thanks so much, Marianne. Great question. Uh, do we have, from anyone else, any any questions for our panelists or the group or just general reactions or insights that anyone else wants to share? I wouldn't mind sharing a few things. Go for it. So um, yeah, so uh, I, when I joined this group, when Patrick uh, uh, got in touch with me, um, I was pretty skeptical about what I would get out of it. Um, to be perfectly honest, not knowing anything about what was going to be going on in the uh, seminar, but I have, um, you know, very I have a very strong interest in Buddhist meditation um, and in. Um, contemplative prayer as well um, and so it was the group was attractive to me for that reason and I have to say by this point uh, <clears throat> I, I, um, I have developed first of all a real respect for all of you um, involved in this project probably especially Patrick because he's just been so um, masterful in running it <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm I'm getting over a cold, so I might be a little bit. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I really have developed an appreciation for what Kelly was talking about earlier, and that is um, instead of looking at myself as I'm in biological sciences. And so instead of looking at myself as a 
purveyor of information only. Um, I have really started to think, although I haven't put it into practice yet because I've also been on sabbatical um, this year. But I have big plans for the uh, for the fall modifying uh, going to modify both my syllabi for the fall um, to include contemplative pedagogy. Um, <clears throat> but what Kelly was talking about earlier, where I now think of myself as somebody where my it is my job, my job description to educate the whole person. Um, and I think, you know, this whole time I haven't really been, you know, I certainly have a rapport with students, but um, I hadn't really thought about that concept of educating the whole person um, to any degree of seriousness. So, um, so that's kind of been been my experience, and um, it's been, um, you know, really, really uh, rewarding. And I can't wait to to start, you know, working it into my my uh, courses in the fall. Thank you so much, Angela. John. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, first, I want to echo what Angela said about your leadership, Pat. Thank you for being our our uh, director for this. It's it's um it's not just organized. It's it it's also uh, caring and enlightening. And I don't know uh, that any of us could have done a better job. So thank you for being you. Um, then, kind of beyond that, uh, when I think about like the title of the panel like why use contemplative pedagogy, it starts to become like, well, what are the alternatives, right? So like we heard Kelly talk about instructionism just now, and I never heard it called that, but I I'm very familiar with that approach and, and Frere's critique of it and, and others. It, unless you're super happy with our culture, um, we got to try something different. And so let's try something different. And then uh, when I'm thinking in those terms, it's not just the classroom, right? So it, it's like, why use contemplative practice? I already mentioned like at all for a life, but if we go for more community stuff, our classrooms are only some of our communities. And so our faculty groups are pretty key communities and several of us have made efforts to introduce uh, at least an opening meditation or uh, at the faculty senate mary has introduced a moment of silence at the beginning and i really do think those make small cultural differences that have potential to do more and so we might not uh, be where i dream of or anything like that but i do see this as as positive steps lately and so i'd encourage everybody to at least give it a try again, unless you're super happy with how everything is going in Western culture. Thank you, John. And Kelly Shea. Uh, as most of this group knows, I'm the I'm the newbie, uh, despite my advanced uh, appearance of age. Uh, but really, what I just wanted to say was, I'm very uh, and Marianne. This re re this re goes back to our work that we've done in WAC. I think that there are that students learn in different ways. And if we're going to worry about coverage, then we have a problem because there's no way we can cover everything that we really have to cover. You always run out of time. So our job is to be a little bit more systematic about how we approach it. But I also think we need to help our students be ripe for learning um, and to use different techniques that will help them learn, like writing, right? I mean, We've talked over the years about using writing to help students learn material. That is not a waste of time um, if it's done well and, and done you know, thoughtfully. And I really also pandemic related just felt that my students were just not, they weren't ready. They, weren't, they were just so stressed and so keyed up that just to bring a few minutes of, of conversation or, or of, of breathing, um, into the room to help them get ready to learn was really important. And I also think it was important just to introduce the idea of it in general to them, like just to have people understand that these things exist out there and that even though we're at a Catholic university, it doesn't have to be praying per se, although it could be. Um, and just to really, because, you know, we have a lot of students from a lot of different religious or faith backgrounds and none. 
and I think helping students see different ways of, you know, being spiritual, I think is really important. And I also think that it, I felt that it, I felt that it has helped me become more, um, it's relaxed me at the beginning of my classes and my meetings, um, but also um, helps students sort of see me as a different type of person, which I kind of, I value that because I think st students need to see us as human beings um, and not just the, you know, the purveyors of information or the graders of papers or, or whatever. So uh, for me, it's just, it has been transformative. And um, for the most part, my students have been very receptive to it. And, um, you know, basically I just say, I just call it breathing and that, that seems to, people seem to kind of get that. So I'd encourage us all to encourage our colleagues to get involved in the next iteration of, you know, contemplative pedagogy, because I think, you know, the more of our folks out there doing it, I think the better. Thank you. And that's a wonderful segue to the announcement segment of our program. Thank you, Kelly, for teeing that up. Uh, Marianne, you'll be happy to learn, and maybe Jerry too. Uh, there, there is, uh, we do have plans for another cohort to go through the seminar uh, in this coming year, uh, as well as some uh, other opportunities, maybe lower commitment opportunities for other faculty to get engaged. So, uh, so do stay posted uh, on that one. Well, uh, there are more things coming. Um, all right, well, so thank you. I want to thank again, first of all, our, our panelists. So Kelly, Lisa, and, uh, and Grace, especially for flying in here. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing your experiences. Uh, thanks to, uh, to our guests for good questions and, and being here and uh, to the whole group um, for you know, the support that you give each other and, uh, and for the insights. Uh, if the CP fellows can stick around for, um, for just a, a few minutes afterwards. Uh, but otherwise, uh, this is uh, this is the last official event for Contemplative Community Week this year. We'll be back next year. Uh, but for anyone who might be watching the recording, uh, just know that uh, if uh, you feel like you missed something, uh, you you probably didn't miss it all. Uh, all the at least teams events for the week uh, have been recorded and will be available on uh, that website off of the Center for Faculty Development. So you can go back and watch anything that you might have missed. There are also suggestions here, there about uh, what you might do if you want to uh, begin to develop a contemplative practice or continue deepening a practice. Uh, there are some things there for you as well. All right, so thanks again uh, to everyone for being here. Take care. Thanks, have a great day, folks.